It's really good to be able to come to worship on this crisp April morning, isn't it? To meet with the Lord as his family. Let us just take a few moments to be still as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. This morning's service is a service in two halves, in a way. The first part of the service is about Palm Sunday, and the second half of the service moves on right to where Jesus is tried and scourged and mocked and crucified. Um, many years ago, I think I was still on trial as a local preacher, I preached at Borby Road, I think it was in John Wiltshire's time, and I had um, a theme called Hosanna to Crucify. So I guess in a way this morning, our service is following that theme from Hosanna to Crucify. As we worship God this morning, we hear words from Matthew 21, verse 5. See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And gathered the whole company of soldiers round him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spat on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you, who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. Huh. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also 
heaped insults on him. Here ends our reading. So as we've already said this morning, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem marks the beginning of what we know as Holy Week, a week that for the Jews was their Passover celebration, the time when they remembered how they were freed from slavery in Egypt and saved from death by painting the doors of their houses, the wood round the doors of the houses with the blood of a lamb. Seven days that changed the world. Seven days that have been the topic of millions of publications, countless debates and thousands of films. These seven days have inspired the greatest painters, the most skilled architects and the most gifted musicians. To try and calculate the cultural impact of these seven days is impossible, but harder still would be to attempt to account for the lives of men and women who have been transformed by them. What very often doesn't come over in paintings and in sculptures and in our reading is the horror, the brutality of crucifixion, the torture that a man condemned has to endure. William Barclay, in his commentary on Matthew 27, says this, Pilate had Jesus scourged or flogged, as it says in some translations. Roman scourging was a terrible torture. The victim was stripped, his hands tied behind him, and he was tied to a post with his back bent double and conveniently exposed to the lash. The lash itself was a long leather thong, studded at intervals with sharpened pieces of bone and pellets of lead. Such scourging always preceded crucifixion, and it reduced the naked body to strips of raw flesh and inflamed and bleeding wheels. Most men died under it. Most men lost their reason under it, and few remained conscious to the end of it. Barclay goes on to say, <clears throat> we are sometimes told that we should not dwell on the physical aspect of the cross, but we cannot possibly have too vivid a picture of what Jesus did and suffered for us. A number of years ago, the Mel Gibson film Passion in Christ hit our cinema screens. It was rated an R-rated film because of the depiction of the brutality of Jesus scourging and mocking and crucifixion. I don't know whether you saw it. I did. It was a hard watch, but it made me realise the true reality of what Jesus went through for you and for me. I have a video at home, and for a, might even be a DVD actually, and for a number of years, I watched it each Easter as a reminder of Jesus' sacrificial love. All in all, the death of Jesus was horribly violent, but the violence and the realism is not the greatest achievement of uh, Mel Gibson's film. The greatest achievement is the redeeming power of love. As you watch Jesus' body being crushed, you see that there is more to the event than violence, that Jesus is acting out of a sacrificial love that makes me and you want to act sacrificially too. 
I'm going to show just a short clip from that film when Jesus is scourged. It is a hard watch. It is a short clip. If it's too much for you to look at, please feel free to look away. What I want you to hold on to is that what Jesus went through was for you and for me. Jesus was innocent and yet he suffered the punishment of a common criminal. When Jesus began his ministry, he knew what lay ahead of him. When Jesus entered Jerusalem to shouts of Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, he knew that in just a few short days, the cries would change from Hosanna to crucify. Jesus knew what crucifixion meant no wonder he prayed to his father in the garden of Gethsemane, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Jesus is innocent in every way and yet took on himself the sins of the world, yours and mine. He took the pain. He shed the blood for us. He became the sacrificial lamb. By his blood we are washed clean and by his stripes we are healed. We may shudder at what the soldiers did to Jesus. But all of those involved in his crucifixion were the least to blame. They were just doing the job they had been conscripted to do. They would have no idea who Jesus was, just another criminal. They indulged in their horseplay. But unlike the Jews and unlike Pilate, they acted in ignorance. Maybe for Jesus, there was some comfort in knowing that those who were flogging him, who were mocking him, who were nailing him to the cross, bore him no malice. Surely this reflected in Jesus' words from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. In our passage today, we pick up events after Jesus has been flogged. And to add insult to injury, as they say, they take him to the Praetorium, where he becomes the victim of ridicule. If you have ever been bullied or witnessed someone being bullied or doing the bullying, you will understand perhaps a little of the urge someone has to belittle someone who can't defend themselves, making them feel small so that they can feel greater. <coughs> we perhaps shouldn't fault the soldiers for the scourging or the crucifixion, as they were after all following instructions but what is hard to understand is what they did in between. Matthew 27, verse 28 says, They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his hand as a scepter. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spat on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. 
After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. And then they led him away to crucify him. Why did they do this? Talk about hitting a man when he is down. Their assignment was simple. Take Jesus to the hill to Golgotha and crucify him. But for some reason they wanted some fun first. Strong soldiers encircled the almost dead Jesus and beat him up. The scourging was commanded, the crucifixion ordered, but who would draw pleasure from spitting on a dying man? The spitting isn't intended to hurt the body. Spitting is intended to degrade the soul. And it does, doesn't it? What the soldiers were doing was elevating themselves at the expense of another. They felt big by making Jesus look small. I wonder if any of us have ever done that. Maybe we've not actually spit on anyone. But have we ever gossiped behind somebody's back? Raised our hand in anger? Rolled our eyes in arrogance? Have we ever shone our full beam in someone's rear mirror when they have annoyed us? Have you made, ever made someone feel bad so that you could feel good? Because this is what the soldiers did to Jesus. And when that you and I do the same, we do it to Jesus too. Matthew 25 verse 40 says, I assure you, when you did it to one of the least of these my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. It's hard to take in, isn't it? But how we treat others is how we treat Jesus. I'm sure we can all think of occasions when we've done or said something out of character, something that has even shocked us and then reflecting on it later and wondering what got into us. Having a sleepless night and wishing we had not done or said it. We all make mistakes, don't we? We are all flawed human beings. The truth is we are all sinners. But the even better truth is that Jesus takes our sin to the cross. He takes our flawed lives and Jesus becomes sin for us. The sinless one takes on the face of a sinner so that we the sinners can take on the face of a saint. Jesus took the mocking and the spitting. He took all the suffering out of love for us. It was the custom for the condemned man to carry the crossbar of his cross to the crucifixion site, a journey which would take, they would take them by the longest route so that as many people as possible would see them and be deterred from criminal activity. Their journey to the cross was a lesson to others. Jesus, like many who had gone before him, was so weakened by the beatings that he hadn't got the strength to carry his own cross. And Roman soldiers had the authority to co-opt anyone they choose to carry out any task. A tap on the shoulder with the flat of their spear would deem a person duty bound to do whatever they were told to do. And on this occasion, it fell to a man visiting for the Passover festival, a man from Cyrene in North Africa called Simon. Of course, the mockery continued as Jesus hung on the cross. Casual passers-by hurled insults at him. You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, 
save yourself. The two criminals alongside him heaped insults on him. The chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. You who claim to be the Son of God, save yourself. The problem was they just didn't get it, did they? Jesus could have done what they wanted him to do. He could have called on the angels to save him. He could have walked away from the whole thing at any point. But this was why he came. As he went through the betrayal, his trial, the scourging and the mocking, he had just one focus. To do his father's will. To take our sins on himself so that we can know complete forgiveness, to glorify his Father and to be glorified. It was all for us. As Jesus suffered the indignity of being stripped naked and being nailed to the cross like a common thief, as he suffered the excruciating pain, as he experienced what it was to be made sin, he knew that he was going to rise again on the third day. He knew that the temple, his body, that they had destroyed would be rebuilt in three days. He knew that death would not hold him. It didn't make the pain any less. It didn't make the sacrifice any less. It didn't make his love for us and all people any less. But it did give him the resolve to see it through. Think of the words of that hymn, Alleluia, what a saviour. And what Jesus did for us needs a response from us, doesn't it? In order for the cross of Christ to be the cross of our life, we need to bring something to the foot of the cross. We have seen what Jesus brought. With scarred hands, he offered forgiveness. Through torn skin, he promised healing. He took the path to take us home. He wore our garment to give us his own. God does more than forgive our mistakes. He removes them. He transforms us from what we are without Christ to what we can be with Christ. So this morning, bring to the foot of the cross all your bad moments, your selfish mood and white lies, every flop and every failure. Bring to the cross your anxious moments, your worries, your sorrows and your fears. Bring your hurts and your disappointments. When you say to Jesus, look what they did to me, he says to us, look what I did for you and points us to the cross. Jesus knows what it is to be despised and rejected. He understands all we go through and he draws us to the cross. As you look at the cross, see the blood he shed for you, the spear he took for you, the insults he bore for you, the nails he felt for you. Because he did all this so that you and I may be free from sin and may be transformed into his likeness by the power of his death and resurrection. said at the beginning turn your eyes upon Jesus give all that you have to him amen let us just take in the stillness of this place in the presence of the Holy Spirit and open our hearts to Jesus
Let him take all that binds us. And know the freedom of his forgiveness. For the cross, for his sacrifice, for each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> May the love of Jesus go with you. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon each one of you with kindness and fill you to overflowing with his peace this day and forevermore. Amen. May the love of Jesus go with you, and may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon each one of you with kindness and fill you to overflowing with his peace this day and forevermore. Amen. <clears throat>